Good morning. Good to see uh, everyone here at the church house that's helping uh, get this uh, service together. So we can present it to you on Facebook and YouTube. And we'll upload this message, obviously, uh, for your worship service. Uh, we are in the Gospel of Mark, and today's text takes us to chapter 10, verses 23 through 31. So open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, verses 23 through 31. Mark chapter 10, I'll begin reading with verse 23. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. And King James Version will have those who trust in riches. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters, mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. After our Lord's encounter with the rich young ruler, who refused to repent of his idolatry, and his idolatry was his material wealth. After the rich young ruler refused to repent and follow Christ, Jesus turns now to his disciples with this warning, again in verse 23, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus, thinking here of the rich young ruler who traded his soul for his wealth, Jesus makes this application and warning uh, to his disciples. But it's not just his disciples that he warns. It's anyone who would ever read these words. When your wealth becomes your God, then you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Like the rich young ruler who was confronted with his idolatry when he refused to repent and walked away from Christ very sad. He had lost all hope of eternal life. God is a jealous God. He will not share himself with other idols. Now, while the focus of this text is on material wealth, the sin, I should say, of idolatry, worshiping material wealth, idolatry includes anything that comes before Christ. Relationships, hobbies, religion, status, whatever it would be that would come between you and a right relationship with God through Christ, that is your idol. But while we're on the subject here of material wealth, let me say this. Wealth in and of itself is not sinful, nor some great evil. The Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil, but rather the love of money is the root of all evil. Listen to Paul in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It was not the rich young ruler's wealth that kept him from the kingdom of God. It was the rich young ruler's love for his wealth that kept him from the kingdom of God. In the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew, Chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus issues this warning. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, or mammon. How many people will enter hell because they tried to do what Jesus said was impossible? To serve both God and 
and money. If we go back to the rich young ruler again for a moment, we find that he was probably a, a ruler of a synagogue. He was Jewish. He was wealthy, obviously. He was well respected and he was moral. And so he believed that he was righteous. When Jesus said, you know the commandments, and he lists the commandments, the rich young ruler says, I've kept these from my youth. And so the rich young ruler believed that he was serving God until Jesus revealed that his true God was not Jehovah, but his wealth. And when Christ called him to repent, the rich young ruler refused. And by his refusal, it was revealed just how much he did hate God because he chose his wealth over Christ. What happens when you try to serve both God and wealth is that you end up giving lip service to God while in your heart you are devoted to what you desire most, material wealth. Jesus said it's impossible to serve both God and money. But people think, if I just had enough money, then all of my problems would be solved. But what people who think that way don't often consider is that with material wealth comes great temptation. And that temptation is to make wealth your God. That's why Jesus warned his disciples in verse 23 by saying how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And when Jesus' disciples heard him say this, verse 24 says that they were amazed at his words. Now they were amazed at the words of Christ, not for the reason that you would think, such as the wisdom of Christ's teaching here, or the power and authority of Christ's words. Now Jesus' disciples were amazed because they couldn't believe Jesus said that. You see, the prevailing worldview among the Jews at that time was that material wealth was a sign of God's blessing. So, why is it hard then for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? Aren't they the recipients of God's blessings? We need to consider several points very carefully here as we move forward. It, while it's true that righteous people can prosper materially, and such circumstances should be understood as God's blessing, look at Abraham, Look at King David and look at King Saul, just to name a few. They were wealthy and prosperous by the hand of God. But material prosperity is not always an indicator of God's divine blessing. And I might add that the lack of material prosperity doesn't necessarily indicate God's wrath against a person. Take Job, for example, who was very wealthy but... When God allowed Satan to test Job, Job lost his children, he lost his wealth, and he lost his health. And when Job's friends came to comfort Job, what did they accuse Job of? Sinning. You must have sinned greatly against God for God to take away your family and your prosperity and your health. But Job hadn't sinned against God. You see, Job's friends, those miserable counselors as he called them, had the same skewed view of the connection between material prosperity and, and, and God's blessing as Jesus' disciples did. And so in verse 24, the second part of verse 24, Jesus tells his disciples again, children. It's as if he's calling the disciples by their first and middle and last name. 
to get their attention as parents do children today. Children, how difficult it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. So for those who think that material wealth is the answer to life's problems, keep in mind this, that the problems that money can solve are not worth the temptations that money brings. One commentary writes, So powerful is the hold which wealth has on the heart of the natural man. He is held fast by its bewitching charm, and, there's, and is thereby prevented from obtaining the attitude of heart and mind necessary for entrance into the kingdom of God. Now, just how difficult then is it for those who trust in their wealth to enter the kingdom of God? Jesus says that it's utterly impossible. And he uses a nice graphic word picture to explain the point in verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. There's never been a gate discovered that is called the eye of the needle where camels had to stoop down and crawl through to carry their load into the city. That's never been discovered. It is a Metaphor. It is a figure of speech, and it is a literal camel that Jesus has in mind, which would have been the biggest, probably the biggest animal in the Middle East that, that people could associate with the opening of a small needle, being the smallest passageway that they could possibly imagine. So Jesus takes this word picture to say basically it's easier to thread a needle with a camel than to get in the kingdom of God worshiping your wealth. It's true, you can't take it with you. And the reason you can't take it with you is because God will not let you take it with you when, in your lifetime, that wealth was your God. Well, we've heard this kind of teaching our whole lives, that you can't take it with you, that there's no U-Haul pulled by a hearse. Even the kings of Egypt, the mighty pharaohs, who had all their spoil buried with them. When their, their tombs were looted and the ones that weren't looted were later discovered by archaeologists and there was all of their wealth still in the grave. We've heard that our whole lives. But this kind of teaching was not known to the disciples because they believed that material wealth was a sign of God's blessing. And so in verse 26, the disciples were exceedingly astonished. The King James has astounded out of measure and said to him, then who can be saved? The disciples were probably thinking, well, if the rich aren't saved, then how is anyone saved? If the rich aren't saved, what about us? We don't have anything. Are we saved? Now, aside from the error in their thinking, about material prosperity being a blessing from God, the disciples' question is a good question. Then who can be saved? This is the most important question, isn't it? And Jesus answers this question in verse 27. Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. And so the first thing we want to notice is that with man, salvation is impossible. It's impossible for humanity to save itself unto God. Rich or poor, it doesn't matter. There's absolutely nothing that we can do to contribute to our salvation. We cannot save ourselves. And that fact is borne out in with God sending His Son to save us. If we could save ourselves, God would not have sent Christ to save us. We can't save ourselves, therefore God sends one who can, His Son, Jesus Christ. And so what's impossible for us to do is very much possible for God. 
For God and God alone has done everything that is necessary to save sinners. So no matter who you are, rich or poor or somewhere in between, Christ has done all that is necessary to redeem you to God. But if you reject Jesus Christ and His redemptive work, and you trade your soul for the world, then you, like the young rich ruler, as you turn your back on Christ and walk away, must understand that you're walking away from all hope of eternal salvation. In walking away from Christ, you have charted your course for hell, and there's no turning back. We come to verse 28, and Peter is maybe needing assurance, or Peter is worried about his status, and his fellow disciples' status in the kingdom of God, or Peter is worried about compensation for doing the right thing. He asks this question, whatever those motivations are. He says, see, we have left everything and followed you. Lord, we're not like the rich young ruler who walked away for his wealth. We left everything to follow you. And notice Jesus' response to those who forsake all to follow him in verses 29 and 30. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel. Now let's stop there for a second. Whatever it is that would keep us from following Christ, we must walk away from, as it were, in order to follow Christ. Jesus is not teaching that we must neglect our children or abandon our families to follow Him. But what He is saying is that there can be nothing to prevent us from following Him. And for all who leave everything to follow Christ, if God requires you to leave your father or your mother, what will happen to you? Look at verse 30. You will receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. You see, in the, in the bond of Christ, we are all one. And we have a thousand fathers and a thousand mothers and a thousand children in the body of Christ. We have not been abandoned. Now we read these words, and for us, we have never ever had to do something like that because we've been pretty much raised up in church and, and, and our families went to church and no one was rejecting you because you went to church and followed Christ. But you read these verses in a Muslim country where a young Muslim man or woman comes to faith in Christ and instantly he has to make this decision. My parents will reject me because of this. What will I do? Will I follow Christ or will I deny Christ in order to appease my unbelieving parents? It's a very hard choice to make. And it's a choice that has to be made for Christ. For the rich young ruler, it was his wealth, and he wasn't willing to part with that to follow Christ. That was his idol. It may not be material wealth. It may be some other idol in our lives that keeps us from following Christ. But know that what we give up to follow Christ, we actually lose nothing. Christ will make sure that we receive in this time, he says, houses, a home, brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children, family, and lands, a place of belonging within the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, now on this earth. But then Jesus says, with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So what we give up to follow Christ, when we forsake all to follow Christ, those things that are idols in our heart, we dethrone to follow Christ. We follow Christ in what the Bible describes as an evil and adulterous generation, which means we will be persecuted for our faith. But what we suffer for Christ in this age, 
will one day give way to eternal life, Jesus says, in the age to come. And so Jesus tells his disciples there in verse 31, lastly, that many who are first will be last, and the last shall be first. Life is not about how much we can gain, but whether or not we know Christ. And all who truly know Christ on the terms of the gospel, whether they are rich or poor, we will all be equal as we stand in the glory of God in heaven on the last day. The first will be last and the last will be first. We will all share alike in the glory of God's eternal kingdom. So the standard by which we are made fit for heaven has nothing to do with our station in life, who we are, what we have, who we know. Because the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Fallen man is saved not by his works, but by the works of Christ. By God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone we are saved. As the 18th century Puritan Jonathan Edwards said, You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. And so when you turn from your sin to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, He forgives all of our sins, past, present, and future. He reconciles us to our Heavenly Father. And He grants us eternal life to live forever with Him in His heavenly kingdom. But what we realize in today's text is that if you reject Christ and His gospel for the idols of this world, you will never see the eternal salvation of God's kingdom. But you will perish outside the celestial city in the outer darkness of hell's fire, which is the burning wrath of God for our sins upon us. Let nothing in this life keep you away from Christ and the life to come. Repent today. Believe in Christ by faith alone. It is not too late. Do not delay, though, because in your delay, you could very well lose your soul. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Christ, and we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would work conviction and Faith in our hearts draw us to our Savior to redeem us from our sins and the judgment that is due our sins. Father, we have gathered small here today, those who are running the sound and working the cameras and leading the singing, for those who will listen later in this day. Father, we know that your word will not return unto you void. So may it accomplish whenever this sermon is watched salvation in Christ that is necessary. Through faith in Jesus alone, we pray in His name. Amen. If uh, later on you read, hear this message and you search these scriptures out and you have a question or you need prayer, uh, call the church and the answer machine will pick up the message and I'll check throughout the week and return that call. 1-270-258-5798. It's never too late to turn to Christ, but don't delay. There's much danger in putting off Jesus. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.